So, um, welcome to this event, which is obviously very interesting to many people, which I like. Uh, the University of Vienna is very big and very diverse, 19 faculties. So we have developed over the years mechanisms of bridging boundaries between faculties, bringing people together who work in different faculties. We have about 18 uh, active research platforms which bridge faculties, bridge between faculties in many different fields. Now, um, Another topic, and they will be connected in a minute or so, uh, within the next few years, we will heavily invest into new fields. And when I, I think in this room even, said some time ago, well, we will invest in data science and just mentioned the word mathematics. There was immediate protest from the economics faculty or from the statistics people who, who, who made me aware, which I obviously knew anyway, that data science is also statistics, and of course it's also computer science. So in that uh, environment, I'm very glad for the initiative of Professor Möller and his colleagues to actually connect these three disciplines um, over data science, namely statistics, computer science, and mathematics. Uh, as some of you know, I'm a mathematician, and I'm especially interested if data science is, in David's view, really the end of theory, I hope not. Uh, in my own mathematical past, I sometimes have combined, I mean, my past is more uh, modeling, physics-based modeling with partial differential equations, but I have, especially in projects with car industry, also combined uh, big data approaches uh, like uh, um, support vector machines and uh, physical modeling, and I think that might be the future. Um, well, I have known David Donahue for Many years, uh, we have not met since 15 years, I think, and we might have both changed since then. Um, but I'm glad that he came and gave sort of the inaugural lecture of this quite important research platform. And we will invest, as I said, quite heavily into this field in the new development plan, and we start to advertising professorships in, actually in October, or no, well, October probably, there will be uh, one or two positions in machine learning, there will be a data science in astrophysics professorship, there will be a computational medicine together with a med medical university, which might also involve data science, there will be a professorship between computer science and uh, the philological faculty of uh, digital text science, I think it's called. So a lot of investment into that field, and of course that has to be connected somehow, and that's also one of the roles of this research platform. So thank you very much, and somebody has to introduce the speaker. I think. Thank you very much uh, for introducing us. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming. Uh, before we introduce the speaker, I do want to introduce, say a few words about the platform, uh, what our goals are, and how you can get involved, and also who we are. So this picture is up there, uh, so you can connect uh, names with faces. And uh, when the... Hello? Yes. Um, there is time uh, with wine and cheese to mingle and, uh, and talk, and so you know who to talk to, <laughs> among other people. Um, so uh, what we are doing with our expertise is in many different ways. Uh, we're coming from areas as operations research and analysis, financial econometrics, uh, model selection and optimization, deep learning, data mining and process mining, as well as visual data analysis, which is my own personal expertise. Um, in the platform, we are very young. We officially exist since May 1st. Uh, we're focusing on, a, on several different, uh, also quite diverse application areas, such as astronomy, digital humanities, medical science, finance, and industry 4.0. And uh, while they are very diverse, what they all have in common, uh, they all uh, use similar methodologies um, that we are transporting from sort of the, the mathematics, statistics, and computer sciences into these fields to um, solve these challenging problems. What are our next steps uh, in short? Well, today I'm, I'm very happy to have uh, Dave Donohue here uh, from Stanford University to kick off 
uh, a lecture series to start uh, hopefully a bright future of data science at the University of Vienna. Um, and uh, we're planning uh, uh, a lecture series in the next academic year. Um, we have Andrew Gehlman from Columbia confirmed to speak on November 9th, and we have Gudrun Gersman from University of Cologne confirmed to speak on uh, April 4th, 2019. Uh, there's more to come. Uh, please check out our websites and so on. Um, we are also, uh, one of the mandates that we have uh, that we're planning to do is to work on several different graduate programs. Um, uh, 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 specifically those three, a master's in business analytics, a master's in data science, and a master's in digital humanities. So combining the business end of things, the science end of things, and the humanities, uh, it will be quite challenging to make this work, but it's also a lot of fun. And our credo here is interdisciplinarity. Um, in many different ways, please do get involved. Uh, we're not uh, a closed bunch. Uh, we're here to engage. We're here to work with anybody that has data science problems or interests. Um, in terms of research partners, uh, feel free to uh, give a talk uh, in our lecture series, become engaged in different ways, become an associate member if you uh, feel that's appropriate. In terms of industrial partners, we have a track record to work with uh, different companies. We are driven by real world problems. And uh, of course, we're always looking for sponsors, if you'd be so kind. Um, for students, we're actually uh, holding a summer school um, on September 3rd to 7th on deep learning and visualization, which is sponsored by the uh, Aktion Network. Uh, together with partners from the Czech Republic. Um, the website is still hot and, and, and fresh off the press. Uh, please check it out um, and apply for it. Uh, there's also a student organization forming, which I'm really, really excited about. The uh, student representatives, I've seen them, they're also in the room, please talk to them. They have a little website and a mailing list um, as pointed out here. Um, I do want to uh, thank uh, especially the Rectorat uh, for actually trusting in us uh, to create this initiative, to give us a, a, a startup funding, to create something new and, uh, uh, um, and nice here at the university. Um, I'd like to thank, of course, all of you for coming. I especially like to thank uh, Dave Donohoe from coming from so far away to give a talk. But I also really like to thank these three people for organizing a lot of stuff behind the scenes to make this day happen and to make uh, a lot of the other things happen in, behind the scenes. This is all I want to say. You can get in touch with us through our website, through our Twitter feed, through our mailing list. Uh, and please stick around after the talk for chats and for a little drink and something to eat. Um, but now I give over to Philip Gross to introduce the speaker to you. And uh, yeah. Okay, so thank you very much, Thorsten. So we have now come uh, to the main part of today's event. It is my great pleasure to introduce today's keynote speaker, Professor David Donohoe. Dave did his undergraduate studies at Princeton under the supervision of um, Tuki and his graduate degree in Berkeley under the supervision of Peter Huber. He is currently professor of statistics as well as the NT and Robert M. Bayes Professor of Humanities and Sciences in Stanford. His research spans the areas of statistics, signal processing, harmonic analysis, data visualization and data science in general. In each of those areas, he has made fundamental contributions, among which I would like to mention his landmark work on the construction of low-dimensional representations of high-dimensional data science problems using methods from harmonic analysis, which ignited a whole new research area now called multi-scale geometric analysis as well as his development of new data sampling strategies now going under the name of compressive sensing that are orders of magnitude more efficient than had previously been dreamed possible. As a specific application of this work, these methods allow for a dramatic speed up in MRI image acquisition where in some setups um, 
going from around one hour of acquisition time to about 10 minutes without any degradation in image quality. David is one of the most influential and highly decorated stati statisticians and mathematicians in the world. He was named the most highly cited author in the field of mathematics in the decade 1990-2000. He has received a large number of prestigious prizes, including a MacArthur Fellowship, the Norbert Wiener Prize, membership in the um, Academy of Science and the Shaw Prize. I personally consider Dave to be a visionary. He has a unique gift to spot the most pressing problems and unveil their deep and beautiful mathematical structure. His work has inspired me countless times and I'm sure the same is true for almost any applied mathematician. So it is really exciting for us to have you here, Dave. And now we are looking forward to your talk on data science, the end of theory. Does the microphone work? I guess so, yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for the opportunity and uh, thank you for the nice introductions. Uh, to the rector, I want to say that uh, certainly an important role in my intellectual formation has been studying inverse problems and uh, being influenced in particular by your work and the beauty of the approach to inverse problems that you represent. Uh, I think everybody should understand that field much, much better than most people do. Uh, I'd also say that uh, data science is uh, a happening thing, and I hope I can represent some of it, but I can't claim that I can represent all of it in this. So I, fi I bear a heavy responsibility, and perhaps I'll only discharge a fraction of what you expect. Um, I do want to say I'm using some Google search images here, and I don't have copyright for those, but it's all for educational purposes. I have no idea what your copyright laws are here. I hope I'm not doing something unethical by Austrian laws. Um, also, there's a paper which you can download uh, called 50 Years of Data Science, which partially goes over the material of some of this talk, but by no means all of it. And that gives the perspective of a statistician. I'll try to reflect a broader perspective throughout this talk. If you haven't thought about this, I want you to think about this very carefully. The decade that you're living through right now is an important dividing point in human history. Actually, there's a massive difference between everything that came before and everything that comes after. For example, if you had read a guidebook to travels in India in 2010, which is not so long ago, it would tell you that there are many villages in India that haven't really changed for 2,000 years. And, and that would be without hyperbole. There, there would have been people there who didn't have exposure to modern thinking and ideas, and the, the future was only uh, a hazy mist to them, some sort of legend. Okay, That's not true anymore. In fact, peasants everywhere on Earth have mobile phones, and increasingly their children have mobile phones, and increasingly they have smartphones, 
and increasingly they're enmeshed in the information civilization that we've been busy creating over the last eight decades. This is an utter transformation of human experience and the symbol of it is right in front of you here. We couldn't make these pictures 10 years ago, but we're living today. Uh, so if you look at, uh, for example, the world's population, it's approaching 8 billion, of which uh, somewhere between 5 and 6 are adults. The number of literate adults is over 4.5 billion. The number of individuals with mobile phones is about the same as the number of literate adults. So literacy has made progress in 500 and 50 years since Gutenberg to reach the exact same number of people as the mobile phone is reaching today. That shows how rapid the technology diffusion has been. At the same time, smartphones are almost up where mobile phones are. And about a billion and a half smartphones are being sold each year. Many are repeat sales, but you can expect this bar to reach up in the next few years and basically equal the number of humans. So this is really a, a major technology shift. In comparison, computers, which many of us think of as everyday, are actually not everyday globally. The penetration of computers is much lower. And so this event of penetrating the population is really profound because it brings computational and data gathering equipment out to the edge to parts of the population that never were reached with just computers. In addition, what we do with those mobile phones has been changing and it's been changing us. As I walked in here today, there were countless people standing out in the lobby, every one of them deeply absorbed in the information that was flowing to them on their devices. And I dare say there's a big responsibility that I have standing here because I know of all the gigabytes of messaging <laughs> that are represented by your devices that you're holding yourselves back from at the moment to give me your attention. I wouldn't have been able to say that 10 years ago. I, I would just take it for granted that I have your attention. The number of hours uh, of time that humans spend with their devices is now approaching three hours a day, averaged over all humans, all hours, everything. So it, it's changing behavior fundamentally and then one other thing is that it's not just talking to relatives or searching information. Increasingly, there are apps that are also modifying your behavior by notifying you or by seeking information on your behalf, often automatically. So the penetration of apps and, and mobile web is getting increasingly large. If you, if you look at the number of apps downloaded in a year, it's approaching half a tera download, I don't, I don't, a giga download, I don't know what the, what the words are anymore. Uh, but let's say 500 billion downloads of apps a year. And then each one of those apps is doing stuff all the time, actively, whether you're asleep or not. All that activity is generating data and it, the accommodation of all of that data has required a civilizational level project to engineer, instrument, and enable it. So we now have data centers in Greenland fed by hydro and geothermal 
connected by cables that had to be newly laid across the Atlantic to reach those data centers. There's also data centers above the Arctic Circle that are just there simply to field web searches for some of the main players like Google. And they've had to re-instrument everything in certain towns north of the Arctic Circle simply to allow this to happen. Inside there, there are uh, massively specially built data centers that can accommodate with extreme energy efficiency and low heat generation all the data that's flowing through them. This is a really massive project that's taken place. And we don't think about it, but if you just realize we've reached essentially 100% penetration of the human population, which are these devices that are exchanging gigabytes of information daily per human being, it's a gigantic effort. Uh, the, the style of having these devices actively generating data requires all this messaging, all this cloud computing to become somehow a, a, a just a given, a, a part of the world that we can all rely upon. So a massive latent computing power is just sitting there waiting for your mobile phone to check for mail or, or check the weather or to report your location. And then a, a, just a trivial corollary of all of this activity is an amazing increase in computational power that's available to everybody through cloud services like AWS or Google Cloud Platform or Microsoft Azure. Just simply having all the ability to service all of those phones means that there's on-demand computing power at uh, unheard of levels that no one could imagine 10 years ago. An individual for a few tens of thousands of dollars can consume a million CPU hours in a few calendar days. That's a level of intensity, and, and that's anybody. That's not like with a special hardware installation or some kind of entitled, you know, inside access. It's a complete game changer. Okay, so these are some of the things that are going on. These are just facts, and I'm just asking you to ponder them and to really try to take them to heart and understand that this has happened. It, it isn't something I'm advocating. It isn't a point of view that I'm telling, that I'm selling or something. No, this is done. There are lots of things that are going to happen because of this, but I think if you just let it sink in that it's done, it may have an effect on you. So what I wanted to do today is talk about the consequences of this in terms of it has forced the emergence of data science as a field. Data science as a field is a corollary of this activity. There are other things of importance that are going to be caused by this transformation, but definitely data science as something that sprang into existence comes out of this. So I want to talk about some of the aspects, including psychological, of this data science moment and including the impact on universities and academia. And then I want to connect this to other things you may have heard about. I have a certain point of view on what data science is, which I want to relate to you, and then compare with things you may have heard about, but perhaps in a different way, like you can tabulate and correlate your uh, experience of the media and various hype waves that are out there in terms of a different way of looking at it. And, uh, and then I'll get to the question about the relationship of theory as time permits. Okay, so let's first of all say that the decade that I'm talking about started about here, really with 
with the adoption of smartphones throughout the Western economies. And then the term data science arose here. This is in a Google Trends analysis. So you can take traditional terms like statistician, applied mathematician, computer scientist, and you can see those have been stable during this period. But data science has exploded, dwarfing these previous categories. So it's, it's actually much more important in some sense of people's interest ref as reflected in web searches. And that's because it transcends academic disciplines. Computer science is an academic discipline, statistics academic. Data science is somehow larger. Um, now, if you look at data analysis, you see that that's still larger, but data science is growing to match it. And it may someday be the term to replace it. Whereas uh, statistical analysis, although important, is somehow stable. What is data science? One way to look at it is that the massive floods of information that I've been talking about in the early part of my presentation create new data resources which then have to be processed to harvest some sort of actionable information. So data science as an activity is the construction of pipelines or what are sometimes called workflows that run data through those pipelines to produce certain products. And people who are data scientists are occupied with the attributes of the data, the attributes of the pipelines, the processes, the product that comes out, etc. So it's, it's some kind of data processing activity, but it's been given this name data science for whatever reasons. As a job category, it's emerged as being something that's a little intermediate between data analyst, someone who cares about the implications and how to tease the implications out, and data engineer, someone who cares about how to store information, access it, and, and effectively manage the process of owning it. Now, I, I want to relate that my own discipline of statistics has gone through a certain amount of confusion over the terminology of data science. As you saw in the earlier slides, statistics, which has been around quite a while, has been surpassed in search interest by uh, data science in the last few years. And uh, many statisticians haven't really known what to make of this. So Marie Davidian was president of the American Statistical Association and she wrote a column, Aren't We Data Science? Uh, Bin Yu uh, was president of the Institute of Mathematical Statistics, and she had a presidential address, Let Us Own Data Science. Um, these are indications that people of a certain age have felt that they've been doing whatever data science seems to be for their whole career and they don't understand the need for a new term. Uh, so let me say a little bit about the traditional statistics angle on this just so that I can evoke what I think is maybe the correct attitude. So statisticians as a discipline are something like doctors or public health experts. We're part of a profession that's been around hundreds of years, maybe since 1650. And we've always been concerned with the public good and also with abuses of data and with abuses of processing and presenting things with data. So we've had the attitude that it's very hard to analyze data. It's easy to be fooled. It's easy to blunder. It requires a lengthy intellectual preparation. Don't talk to anybody who doesn't have that preparation because they're likely to just waste your time and, and abuse people's uh, attention. 
Uh, and then there's something about procedural hygiene which is absolutely essential. Just you've really, really got to know how to go about things and one deviation right or left, just don't talk to this person. Okay, that would be a, a traditional attitude, I think. And if, if you think I'm not being fair to, the, to anyone, st statisticians or others, please you know, raise your hand and, and I'll give you a chance to respond. <laughs> um, and uh, to be fair, you know, statistics really does have a long track record of success. I'll mention a few from the 20th century. If, if you look at the massive increase in crop productivity, if you look at the improvement in the quality of manufactured goods, if you look at the lengthening of the human lifespan, a lot of that has to do with research processes and techniques that were designed by statisticians and that are the product of those kind of sour, persnickety attitudes on the previous slide. Like it actually works to be painfully detail-oriented and to, and to erect standards of the kinds that statisticians have done. Uh, the other thing is that there's about a million scientific articles published per year that use statistical inference, such as null hypothesis significance testing. So it forms the basis for a large share of the scientific literature. Uh, there's all kinds of official roles with the approval of pharmaceuticals and so on, and, and of course there's statistics being taught in many campuses around the world. Okay, so uh, we really do think we know what we're doing in some ways, and at least we have some track record to prove it. Our attitude about um, statistics is that it is a, a data science because we do everything starting from a very clear statement of where the data are coming from with a mathematical model that's generative of the data. Then we use probability theory in most cases and then we explain exactly what the limits are for making inference from limited samples. We develop theoretical principles and then principled methods and we've been doing it for 350 years. So we, we feel we're, we know something and then this data science thing comes along. And so then the presidents of our societies are like, what? Uh, so here is an example of a typical attitude that a statistician might evince. Why do we need data science when we've had statistics for centuries? Uh, but on the other hand, Hadley Wickham, who is a member of the R development core team, R is a data analysis language used by academic statisticians and data scientists everywhere. Um, so Hadley's point in the IMS bulletin, which is a circular of our main mathematical branch, that statistics is crucial but most academic statistics departments are at grave risk of becoming irrelevant. Whether or not this is actually true, uh, I'll leave to you to, to ponder, but uh, at least he said it, and it's something that, that we need to think about. That is, the, maybe the, the problem is that statisticians don't see what's different here. They think there's nothing new. Maybe that's the problem. Um, Hans Rosling is, uh, was, he's recently passed away, uh, biostatistician, uh, epidemiologist, who's very well known for many TED talks and, and so on. Um, he made a point about the perceptions of the world as it is by highly educated people that, uh, runs through many of his TED Talks. He, so he does it in a very effective and entertaining way. Then uh, a book has recently been released uh, with his son and daughter-in-law in which 
he reduces into print the same set of points. I, I, it's really fascinating to look at. The most educated people have perceptions that lag reality the most. Namely, he presents evidence that the, it's the people with PhDs and so on who have a tendency to see the world through the eyes of their teachers at the time the teachers were young. Whereas other people might see the world as it is today, it's sort of unique that various PhDs see it the way the world came together for the, the generation that, of teachers that brought them up and that they had to satisfy in order to achieve their professional certification. So uh, an example of this is if you ask people about uh, infant mortality, the most educated people will paint a picture of infant mortality global. That's basically what the truth was in the 1960s. Actually, infant mortality is dramatically less. Actually, female fertility, as expressed in live births per woman, is dramatically less globally, everywhere, including in those little villages in Africa. But the most educated people, if they're asked to estimate these things, often present a picture that is completely at odds with the truth, but was true many years ago, decades and decades. Something like that may be at work here in the statistics attitude about data science. If we think back years and years ago, it might well be that some of the attitudes that the discipline has developed were extremely appropriate but it could be that we, as statisticians, don't necessarily see the world as it has become. Remember, this change has happened in 10 years. That's an awful lot to digest in 10 years. So one thing that's really happening is that there are a lot of very talented students who want to study data science. So at Stanford, I, I ran the data science master's admission that the statistics department runs. Uh, this year we had maybe 500 applications of extremely able students with extremely good preparation, test scores, whatever, for 15 spots. And uh, it was in initially it was only 10, but I bargained it up a little bit. Um, so there's a, a very large demand for these things. And then in addition, there's a very large response so that if you type in big data or data science into your Google browser so it knows you're interested in that, then you will start learning about all these data science programs that are out there that are literally all over uh, uh, Europe, North America, and are offering degree programs that enable you to study in this particular field. Uh, there are data science initiatives being formed at a, a number of universities, and so it's a frequent occurrence that a university, in this case, the uh, University of Michigan or uh, University of California at Davis will announce a data science initiative and uh, put together a multidisciplinary team that includes computer scientists and statisticians and some others. So the model that we see represented here at the University of Vienna, I think, is becoming uh, part of that trend, and, and it fits in nicely. There's uh, an emerging standard for the data science masters, so the, there's a, a pretty clear set of courses. I sampled here from a program at uh, UC Berkeley. They offer a combination of topics, Quite a few of these would have been 
offered in a statistics department and now there's an overlay where on top of the statistics classes you also offer a few other things that would include some database and maybe also some legal and ethical concerns and then scaling to very large data. So it's a mixture of those data engineering concerns and of more traditional statistics and data analysis concerns. And I would say quite a few programs exist that are using this overlay model. So on top of our traditional statistics education, we're going to mix in a few extra ingredients. So the, the emerging standard in master's programs is that yes, we need traditional statistics courses, but we also need databases and cloud computing. And the distinction between traditional statistics is that maybe traditional statistics faculty just are not that clued in to the emerging world with these massive databases. And, and we need an, another layer on top of that. Are there any questions or does anyone think I'm being unfair? Okay, I wanna talk about data science as a discipline. There are a few emerging PhD programs. So one, for example, at NYU. However, uh, I don't think there's a standard yet of what it would mean to have a, a PhD in data science. So we might be years away from, from some final answer on that. Uh, I have served on, on a number of data science panels and committees. So one recent one was um, a National Academy of Sciences Engineering and Medicine panel called Envisioning Data Science which was talking about the undergraduate curriculum. I've read through some of the documents uh, that the, the same body has issued about masters and so on. There's no yet consensus about PhD. There's no consensus of what is the, the intellectual core. We understand at the master's level, what you wanna have is the ability to prepare young people for a fruitful career we, we don't yet understand what scholarship is going to entail. So I wanna put forward uh, uh, an idea of what a definition could be, which seems to encompass where the interesting action is, and also encompasses what's different about this than either computer science or statistics. So uh, this is just a proposed definition I'll say that data science concerns the recognition, formalization, and exploitation of data phenomenology emerging from digital transformation of business, society, and science itself. So let's go from the back first. Digital transformation I've already introduced you to that notion because we spoke about the way that there's a digital transformation of human behavior going on with everyone carrying measuring devices called mobile phones. Recognition, formalization, and exploitation. Humans upload a trillion smartphone photos a year. Those go up into cloud-enabled databases. There's tens of billions of minutes of human speech recorded every year that go into other databases. So there are these massive amounts of data being collected. It may look at the beginning that these are just being collected into bit buckets, but actually these are assets that once they're recognized and an appropriate means of exploitation is devised, you can do research penetrating extremely interesting intellectual questions. But you have to recognize it. Recognizing that there's data of some kind that's out there to be gotten, that's a big part 
of what could be a discipline of data science, like discovery of a new type of data asset. Data phenomenology, all that data that's out there is not just bits. There may be laws embedded in it, patterns of an unforeseen kind. Recognizing the phenomena embedded in certain kinds of data, that can also be part of data science. So once you understand that digital transformation is a happening thing. We've just gone through a big chunk of digital transformation with the smartphone, but that's not the end. It's more like a continuing process, and we'll see actually an acceleration of digital transformation, and each little bit of acceleration is gonna yield up its own new data, its own secrets and interests. Once you realize this, you see that this is something that can take centuries to work its way out, and that this is an independent area of intellectual investigation. So the, uh, the, the paradigm I'm proposing is that when you hear a, some interesting thing going on, why don't you compare it with this little table? Is there some store of accumulating digital assets that I recognize here? Is, does, do those assets shed light on some data or methodology universe that's being systematically gathered maybe for the first time? Is there some new technique that's going to allow me to exploit it in a way that I just never thought of before. These are the hallmarks of what I view as this new discipline of data science. If you can recognize in what you see something that sort of goes into all three boxes, then you've got something. So I want to give you a simple example, and then I'll go to some more complicated ones. So here's a simple example. This is work by a, a few statisticians, Leah Yager and Jeff Leake. And um, so they're at uh, US Naval Academy and Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. An estimate of the science-wise false discovery rate. Okay, I've said before there's about a million papers a year published that use statistical methodology. And until very recently, that would just be just some words and they would just vanish off into the air as soon as I said them. But it's actually something quite real. You can actually go out, go to PubMed, and get the million abstracts. You can then process the million abstracts and extract information from all of those. The medical literature is a thing. It's an entity. And so there's a digital asset there. There's a universe of discourse that is defined by this thing. So we've filled in two boxes. The third box is we can go into all the abstracts of the medical literature and extract all the p-values. So, so p-values is statistical evidence. So we can get all the reported p-values in all of that. So this is filling in all of those boxes. For some reason, it's not going anymore. How do I uh, advance? Oh, sorry. Now it is. Okay. Uh, so I'll, I'll fill in the boxes a little bit later. Yeah, okay. So here we have the accumulating digital assets are an abstract database, the p-values that they contain, 
software libraries for text mining and text scraping. The emergent data universe is all PubMed abstracts. And the emergent techniques of exploitation is we can make statistics about what all scientists as a whole are doing. And then there's a whole bunch of statistical methodology developed in the paper that I mentioned. So this is an example where we're filling in those boxes. It's, this is a very simple one, but I start with simple in order to make it clear. Now, I'm somehow out of order. Um, so here's another one that I quite like. This is a paper by a team at Harvard School of Public Health. Uh, main thing you can do is look at the end. Late stage ovarian cancer. Okay, so this is a, a malady that affects uh, quite a few women, too many. And there's a considerable amount of literature by different teams about how to make predictions of survival rate based on various phenotypic and genomic signatures. These things are very important in the lives of the affected individuals, and it's also important scientifically. Okay, now, so the literature that's out there is a bunch of studies. Then each of those studies is publishing models. Each of those studies is also, perhaps in a sequestered way, using data that underlies those models, and that is the result of public funding in some clinical trials. So there's this conceptual thing that there's a considerable amount of data and methodology. This particular project studied the literature, itemized all the published models for predicting um, the uh, remaining life of affected individuals, itemized when you could get the model, when you could get the data, uh, both training and validation, and then carefully validated that they had correctly done the work of accessing those models and could apply them correctly. Okay, so they've defined an implicit universe here, which is all the studies about this particular disease and they've accessed all this data that was out there and, and they viewed the models themselves that were being used for prediction also as data that they could access. Uh, they developed an interesting cross data set analysis where they could try each study's model on every other study's data. So a, a cross study analysis, cross-study validation. We're all aware of internal cross-validation as a method, but this is proposing the use of external cross-validation. And uh, the results that they get are that there's a significant difference between the external cross-validation rate and the internal cross-validation rate in such a way that the, uh, the models, if they're just judged by what they report, they seem pretty good. But if you judge them against the other data sets, they're not nearly so good. And so actually, one of the most modest predictions performs the best on all the other data sets and one of the most bold predictions performs nearly the worst. Okay, so, th so it's a way of gathering all that scientific literature as data and analyzing the whole thing. This is also data science. So here we've done recognition of a universe of data set come up with a method of exploitation, and it's emergent because we couldn't have done this 10 years ago. So in this particular thing, what made it possible is the onset of code and data sharing. 
reproducible research. Uh, so you can now define universes of all the relevant methods and models, all the relevant data, and then you can have an emergent technique of cross-study validation. Okay, so this is, a, this is another example of data science. Any questions or problems? Am I being unfair to someone's research? Please speak up. Now, I'd like to turn to what everyone is always eager to hear about these days, deep learning. And um, my motive here is to show that it fits within this paradigm and that there's a different way to listen to every single thing that you hear about deep learning, which I think is more instructive and more informative about what you could maybe get from it. So uh, if we compare, say, statistical analysis, which is a technique that's the bulwark of the scientific method over the last uh, decade, or data analysis, which is used throughout business, science, and technology, Deep learning has gone beyond statistical analysis and its interest to searchers, getting at times pretty close to data analysis itself. One can maybe forecast that it, the, the two will cross at some point, maybe. Although logically that's an impossibility, uh, people don't always obey the logical rules of Boolean algebra. Uh, we can also look at machine learning, data analysis, big data, other terms. And big data is still just marginally ahead of deep learning as a term. Some of the phrases that are out there. Um, so Pedro Domingos, a professor at University of Washington, claims that just hiring one machine learning person into your company adds 100 million to the market cap. Uh, professor Mari Ostendorf told me that if she doesn't do deep learning, she won't have graduate students. This is a very distinguished researcher in speech with 30 years of work at, at, in world-beating organizations. Uh, Professor Les Atlas told me deep learning is killing statistical signal processing because the students don't want to learn all the solid, mathematically grounded signal processing stuff. And so then they will never be able to teach it because they didn't learn it. Uh, <laughs> students want deep learning and um, at the same time, there's uh, researchers are, are transforming things. So there's a conference called NIPS, which used to be an academic conference, and I, I've given a, a keynote speech there, and it was the kind of conference where a lot of people who had very charismatic, somewhat crazy ideas would get together, uh, have breakfast at 5.30 in the morning, go to talks until 8, and then ski all day. And then at 4, listen to talks until 7, and then go for drinks. This is no longer possible. Uh, the, so this is back in the day. You, you could have this in Vail or Whit or something like that. But uh, in 2012, this deep learning foundational event took place that uh, led to a massive sea change. And now this conference became a place for industrial researchers to brag about how many computer resources they have. And, and as this intensified, more and more researchers came in. But last year, not only that, but people became anxious that there wouldn't even be enough hotel rooms. So, the, the conference is no longer at ski resorts. It was at Long, in Long Beach, California last year, which is the 
closest political entity to LAX Airport, which is one of the largest airports anywhere. And uh, essentially all the hotel rooms in, in Long Beach were gone and, and registration had to be closed at 5,000. Obviously it could have gone much higher. This year I hear they're allowing 8,000. It's, it's getting to the place where you can only hold the conference either in Las Vegas or Macau. Okay, now what I want you to do is to think about this development in light of what I'm talking about here. In what way does the deep learning moment that we're going through relate to the proposed definition? See, Actually, that foundational event in 2012, what was that? So that was uh, a deep learning model won the ImageNet competition. And what is ImageNet about? It's a data set that was gathered by Professor Fei-Fei Li and her team based on found digital images. The internet by about 2009 had so many digital images lying around that you could just harvest from the internet a pretty complete database of imagery. Granted, it would be low quality, not produced in some uniform way. Uh, and granted, the labeling might be inexact because you're just interpreting what you see on web pages but it was there as a resource and, and she recognized it and the team implemented it. That gave rise to the ImageNet competitions. Another thing that happened was in 2013, the Oxford English Dictionary added the word selfie to the official lexicon as, as represented in the OED dictionary. Um, so, not just that we had this, but we had this. Teenage girls everywhere choking servers with images. Th that's where those trillion images a year are coming from. Okay, but to accommodate that, you need all these data centers, which creates all this cloud computing capacity, which allows you to have tens of thousands of researchers running through databases of millions of images and training models. It all goes together. So there's a technology story that drove this. If you think that deep learning is an intellectual triumph, well, it's not really an intellectual thing. It's really just a tool that's been proposed and happens to now be practical. So we can see the accumulating digital assets generated by the computing discontinuity that we've just gone through. We can see that created a database of essentially all images that people look at with their phones. And we can see that uh, one can create those either by found imagery or in the case of the big providers like Apple and Google, you just own all that data sitting on your servers. Okay, so uh, Eric Schmidt, chairman of Google, also talked about 2012. He says that the big event wasn't a major mathematical breakthrough. Not really intellectual in that sense. Not theory. Instead, what it really was is we had enough data that very mundane methods could succeed in classifying images, whether they were one of, you know, a certain kind of cat or breed of dog or a certain kind of car we cross some threshold of now we have more data than we know what to do with and we can train and it's in the data. So the Im ImageNet 
classification results, actually in that year, it was about a 16% error rate in top five classification. Now it's gone down to about 3%. And what you hear a lot about in, in the media is, you know, the triumph of deep learning, et cetera, as a methodology. But I would insist there's a larger picture which is connected with the, the paradigm I'm trying to mention to you. The technique of exploitation that made it possible to have this kind of steady improvement is not, I would not nominate deep learning as the technique. I would nominate prediction challenges as the technique which leads to this steady progress. Um, prediction challenges go back to a conundrum in speech research and translation research that goes back at least to the 1950s. That people were claiming to be able to translate and uh, there was always a, a little bit of um, fudging going on. So J.R. Pierce, who was at Bell Labs, and uh, a very respected presidential advisor. Imagine that today. Um, it went, went in and in 1969 wrote a report about speech recognition research in those days that was utterly scathing, like I've never seen even in Trumpian tweets really such intensity as J.R. Pierce was able to manage uh, about how bad the research was in those areas. And in, in these scathing terms, he described that really there was nothing scientific being done in this field and it needed to be closed down entirely. The lack of an actual foundation was so complete there just shouldn't be anybody doing this. Zero funding, zero, and it was zeroed. 1969. When it came back in the 1980s, it was under a completely new set of ground rules which were enforced and, and, and championed by DARPA, the same uh, agency that promoted the internet. They put forward the concept of a common task framework where you have a publicly available training data set, enrolled competitors with a common task to infer a pre class prediction from training data and an automatic scoring referee. Under these rules, speech and translation research was allowed to resume. Then in a series of different challenges over the years, was observed in every single case steady progress, possibly with other technology, This w possibly no neural nets involved, possibly uh, hidden Markov models, possibly support vector machines. It really didn't matter. In every case, what you saw is gradual improvement as the competition years went on, as each iteration of the challenge was held. It's a fundamental technique, and the reason you have fingerprint recognition in your phone, the reason that the Apple iPhone can transcribe your speech and so on and so forth has more to do with this than anything. This is a scientific principle that lay at the rebirth of progress in this area. Part of it is that it's very inspiring to have a defined score that you can go after. In the modern world, for many, that would be money. Uh, in image net classification, it's prediction rate. Just to understand how motivating having a score is, uh, regard these pictures from Sebastião Salgado. In his early photograph, uh, uh, photographic career, he found an open pit gold mine in western Brazil. And in this mine, you just worked in the mud with burlap sack and took what you thought might be 
gold fragments out of the mud into the burlap sack, and it was harvested simply by hand. He was very struck by the fact that even professors and doctors abandoned their whole career to go mine in this pit. And b by the fact that actually they didn't make all that much money, but it was just so thrilling to be digging with all these other people racing in a direct competition. That's how you got the changes we're talking about. Many thousands of highly motivated people, they want to, they, they want to go in and dig in the mud and pull out that little bit of gold. That's a fundamental exploitation technique. And that's what really has worked here, again and again. Ten years from now, I don't know that we'll be talking about, you know, AlexNet, ResNet, VGGNet. It may, may be a switch again to something else, just as we've switched before. But what will be fundamental and still here is the technique of the common task framework. So here we've got Digital, we've got assets like the ability to do massive amounts of computing work, massive image databases that give us a universe of, of discourse, and we've got prediction challenges as an exploitation technique, so we can fill in all the boxes. I feel this is what's really going on with the deep learning revolution, is that these three things have come together. Deep learning happened to be very effective in dealing with the cluster computing framework, particularly when those are furnished with GPUs. So revisiting the paradigm that I've mentioned to you, there's the recognition, formalization, and exploitation of data, and particularly the phenomenology that's embedded in it. And that all that data that's emerging as digital transformation takes hold in field after field and human activity after activity. I propose to you a series of uh, different questions that you can ask. When you hear something interesting, you can immediately see if it's data science, I think, by simply filling in this box. Now, the, so far, everything that I've said has been sort of a-theoretical and, for example, I haven't brought in, you know, math, applied math and so on, which you might have expected that I would say a lot more. But we have a broad audience. But I, I thought it would be interesting maybe to, to look at the paradigm and then talk about some recent developments by some mathematical scientists that I know. So, for me personally, the first example of this is Balaji Prabhakar, who's a double E professor at Stanford, comes up to me one day and says, you know, you can use deep learning to do linear programming. And, you know, the first thing I was thinking is, what are you talking about? Don't say that again. People are going to haul you away. Linear programming is something we have such wonderful theoretical understanding of. And obviously, deep learning has nothing to do with linear programming. You're just, this is just, don't be telling me this. Then, I, so I didn't really understand when, when it first happened to me. That was my first uh, interaction. Second interaction, uh, Professor Brian Wandell, who's in neuroscience, comes up to me and says, you know what, we have this piece of software that processes MRI scans, and through many years, actually maybe 20 years of patient tuning, it's considered the gold standard for telling whether a given voxel in uh, an MRI image is white matter, gray matter, some interstitial fluid, etc. 
But you know, it takes eight hours to run on one image, and I have 100,000 images. So, uh, you know, this research group that I'm working with, they just trained up a deep net, and it gets the same results in 10 minutes. So what can I say at that point? Uh, that the, clearly, uh, Professor Wandel thinks he's getting a benefit from it. And then I realize, oh, okay, so there is something here, which is there's a kind of algorithm speed up in the same way that people are using deep learning to mimic human judgments. I guess now the game is they're using deep learning to mimic complex algorithms that that where you, you have some code, but you'd like to replace it by something faster. So I, I was talking with uh, Professor Philip Gross yesterday about his work, which is a, another example of this, and I think actually a theoretical example, which shows that th there's a room to play. So in, in his example, He's looking at a PDE solver that's used in financial derivatives pricing, I imagine. If, I, if I'm butchering the thing, yeah? And, uh, you know, it's some complicated thing that you have to do in, in, in pricing derivatives. But it is a PDE solver, so it falls squarely within traditional numerical mathematics, I would say. And so there's traditional ways of doing it. In the same way that there's a traditional convex optimization that Professor Prabhakar could have accessed that's based on like really, you know, centuries of careful work and uh, of really, you know, the highest standard of lucidity and clarity and so on and so forth. But it turns out you can use uh, deep learning in that context to get an accelerated answer that works at high accuracy and high dimension in a way that might be very expensive and which Professor Gross can show exactly that you get a dramatically better scaling with dimension. I'm, am I saying it right? Okay. <laughs> um, so how does that fit here? So we've got these existing, well-programmed, well-understood algorithms. That's a kind of digital asset, actually, that we have those codes. We've got an emergent universe. How do we do that? Well, we run the algorithm on lots of examples. And then we create a synthetic database of what this algorithm does all over the place. And then we've got an emergent technique of exploitation, which is deep learning just as an interpolator that basically can reproduce the data that it's given. Now, I'm not necessarily an advocate for this. I'll let Professor Gross here in the front row be an advocate if he wishes. I'm simply saying I now listen to these issues, claims, and so on with a new point of view, is that within this paradigm, this is an example of data science. In this particular case, there's even theory that goes along with it. So there, there is a way that theorists can live in this new world, but they're better off if they understand this paradigm and they can understand where they fit and how they play in the game. And I, I thought that Professor Gross's example was a particularly nice one to illustrate the points of how you can exist in this new world. Thank you for your attention. Okay, so thank you very much, David, for this uh, very nice talk. Um, we are now moving on to the question and answer session. Yes? So.
Well, during Okay, Tom. Um, during the first 90% of your talk, I always thought of the question, well, why do you mention the word mathematics only once? But then you did. You sp spoke a lot about mathematics. So I changed my question actually to the last slide, and I want to challenge just one word, namely the word replace. And I have to discuss this with you also. Why does in that example uh, deep learning replace PDE solvers? I would say it augments PDE solvers. And I have an example from my own work. I mentioned in my introduction that we use the combination of physical modeling and there I mean PDEs with, I think it was support vector machines or whatever, by creating data actually with the physical model, with the PDE model, and use this data to train a, it was in that case not a deep learning, but a data database model and therefore combine the speed of the database, let's say, with the accuracy or the physical reliability of the PDE model. I, I, I would think of that sentence in that way. I, I entirely agree. Um, I've fallen victim to the usual inflammatory language that people use when they're talking about these deep learning things. I certainly, I, I think I tried to express here that uh, what I, th so a typical thing is that it's presented to me, like this is the story that's presented to me by another party. They say, I'm using deep learning to replace convex optimization. It's not my advocacy. I love convex optimization. I, I don't ever want it to go away. And, and like I said, you know, don't be telling me this thing about replacing convex optimization. So I want to make that part clear. Um, so uh, I agree you shouldn't replace, and the fundamental scientific knowledge that we have about how to correctly and use convex optimization, I'm totally all for. And the same thing with PDE solvers. We, we're not trying to replace them. I just say there's a lot of research now where, uh, let's say, you can uh, accelerate the uh, you know, approximate solution of PDEs by mimicking in some way. So I said here, you're, you're mimicking maybe with more or less success. Uh, and so people are making claims of this kind. Uh, now, I, I realize maybe uh, Philip doesn't want to be associated with replace either since his rector is, has said that this is verboten. So, <laughs> certainly, <laughs> I don't think he said replace, but I promise you that Balaji Prabhakar said replace. But I, d I don't hold it against him. I think what he means by that is uh, in, in some applications, it's just of first importance to get a very rapid answer, and so you, you're willing to sacrifice a fair amount of accuracy. Definitely, you need both. Okay, next question. Yeah, so I recently noticed that the quality of answers you get from Google is going down. Uh, probably this is because the data used there is uh, diluted by marketing interests. So the bigger and the more open the data set is, uh, the lower uh, its quality could be. So let me uh, just uh, paraphrase this as an uncertainty principle of data science. Namely, the bigger and more important the data set is, the less reliable are predictions extracted from it by data analysis and I have two more examples, so a very small data set to base this on, namely prediction of elections, and the second is bibliometric evaluation of scientific progress using impact factors. <laughs> well, I, I certainly don't disagree with any of the points that you've brought up. Uh, I, I'll just relate, uh, as far as 
the contamination of large public databases. Uh, I believe, like you do, that I would prefer to put my hands, my, put myself in the hands of higher quality data. I think I think we would all agree. The big surprise here. So since I mentioned ImageNet earlier. Um, before ImageNet, there was something called Pascal, I think. It's an image database that was designed, I think, by INRIA in France. And it was done very, very seriously with a limited number of images, but very high quality labeling and data and so on and so forth. And so when ImageNet was first compiled using found data on the internet, people said, oh, this can never work. I mean, we know how much work went into Pascal and what, you know, what it really takes to do a good job. This Fei Fei Li is just, you know, it's, it's just all bluster. It's never going to work. Uh, so the surprising thing is that it has worked out better than you would think. Like, you can, you can, you can cross-train. You can train on ImageNet and then evaluate on Pascal and do surprisingly well. On the other hand, I, I think you're right that data quality issues are probably job one in data science. So your theory of an uncertainty principle probably should launch a whole research paradigm. And then you mentioned elections, and then since then, we had the whole concept of fake news. We had the whole concept of manipulating publicly available data, sending garbage, and so on and so forth. These all seem to be very legitimate research questions for a new field of data science. So I would nominate you to be the data science minister <laughs> because I think you have all the right concerns. Are there other? Okay, yes. Thank you for that interesting talk. So, what you, would you say, think? What is your prognosis for the future of data science? Will the deep learning hype stay, and for how long? Or how do you think things will evolve? As far as deep learning itself, I think uh, there's a you know there's a larger story of a sort of blood feud between uh, a camp of support vector machine and kernel method people and the networks, neural networks, deep nets, etc. People. So there was a period between about 1997 and 2007 where in contests and comparisons, uh, the support vector machines were consistently winning. And uh, at that time, a lot of, um, a lot of the discussion about uh, neural networks was that they, you know, it was people who couldn't win, but they could say lots of interesting things about their methods, so on and so forth. Then what happened is some changes in, in data availability and computer architecture made the deep nets actually be more scalable. So it's maybe not so much about intrinsic performance. We, we don't really know what performance you could get out of uh, SVMs and so on. They're just not as scalable, and so they can't attack the, necessarily the same size of data set. On the other hand, there's probably brilliant young minds out there figuring out how to scale up all sorts of things. And then it just as soon as one of them just wins, then all of a sudden, a large number of people may switch over to that new method. That's the history of these prediction challenges, is there's a dominant technique until there isn't. Thanks for a very provocative uh, and exciting talk. I'm curious about, um, your, your title was The Death of Theory, and I'm, I'm thinking in particular about drug discovery and sort of biological problems where we have this deep understanding of, of molecules, of cells, of, of protein folding, we, and chemistry. We have all this 
theory, but we're still crap at discovering drugs, and we're still like taking fungi and, and, and just try, you know, just kind of randomly trying. At the same time, we have these huge databases from clinical trials and more and more from human genomics that in principle provide the kind of the, the um, accumulating digital database that we need to maybe try a whole new approach to this, but a lot of it is blocked because of privacy. So this is really a question of how theory and ethics and particularly privacy concerns are gonna work out in the next 10 years of this field. Because these, this seems like a really big problem. We need new antibiotics and we need them now. And, and maybe data science has an answer. So what do you think? Well, you, you can be the minister of health data science. <laughs> so uh, definitely the possibility of um, precision medicine is out there as one big area for data scientists to be working in. And then you're talking about improved, you know, pharmacological development and so on. Those, those all require new data resources, exactly as you've outlined. I don't think I can improve on what you said. I can ratify it. I, I, I think th there's excellent sense in what you're mentioning as the set of factors we need to be working on. That, but I think, again, they can all be worked on within this paradigm. We can, we can recognize there's maybe some data out there that can be used and we didn't think of it yet. It's just being, it's there, it's found. We just have to realize that it has what we need. Maybe, so there's, a, there's an example that I haven't uh, mentioned, but, um, I think it's quite interesting. There's David Madigan and the OMOP partnership, which is an observational study where they got all the health insurance records of some tens of millions of people in the United States. And then for each one of them, they know all the doctor visits and diagnoses, and they also know all the prescriptions and all the... Um, reimbursements that they also received for over-the-counter drugs. So they know quite a lot about these individuals as well as some anonymized personal information. And so those databases are becoming available and, and I could tell a whole case study about OMOP which maybe would satisfy you as showing that data science is going there. But I encourage you to look at that example. Okay, other questions back there? So the um, subtitle that you have is the end of theory, and particularly in this common task framework, there are always predictive tasks. Well, maybe not always, but almost always predictive tasks. So from a statistical perspective, um, could a subtitle be the end of inference? in some sense, or do you also envision a, a common task framework for inferential methods, not just um, prediction ones? Excellent questions from the audience here, by the way. Um, so the common task framework that I've mentioned, uh, as, as I've presented it here, it's always about prediction. However, I, I, I want to say that there are other fields that, that have uh, something that's isomorphic to the common task framework but doesn't involve prediction. So uh, it, uh, relevant to our story, if you ask yourself, why does the internet work? Why does it actually work? It's a, if you look at how the system is set up, it's, it, it, ought to have all kinds of problems. If, if humans operated the network, definitely there would be a lot of lost messages and packets and so on and so forth. So th the reason that it works is through a massive simulation exercise where there's a, a simulation environment that knows basically every node on the internet and knows all the routing tables that are relevant to messages getting from one point to another, and it simulates the behavior of all of those routers and what happens as various policies are changed. Basically, 
uh, an organization like AT&T can every night run a whole workload against its current knowledge of the internet and make sure that nothing got broken. And then they can measure the total throughput and, and how many packets were dropped and so on through this comprehensive simulation. And then the researchers in their uh, network management division can modify the router tables and so on and figure out new policies that would work better. So it's not specifically the, the um, class prediction that we talked about with ImageNet. It's more, you know, recognizing this asset, which is we can model the entire internet, like all the billions of nodes out there, and we can use cloud computing, and we can comprehensively evaluate that a, a certain set of rules and policies work. Okay, so um, that's, it still fits in within the paradigm of data science, it's just not the sort of machine learning model. So I, it is, so, so you gave me an opportunity to clarify that we can get outside of machine learning. What you specifically asked about was uh, inference and um, I think there, in the paper, 50 Years of Data Science, I, I alluded to the following thing. Once you can uh, view all of science and maybe all the data sets and all the analysis techniques as being openly available, then it would be possible to look at practices that researchers have as something that can be run against a whole corpus of science, and you can say, how would the conclusions of this whole field differ if we had researchers using this practice rather than that practice? And then you could see if uh, p-values were different or if you know model accuracy was better, so on and so forth. In, in particular, you could definitely do it in that um, ovarian cancer example that I was talking about, but it ought to be more general. So statisticians for a long time have been interested in the systemic effects of people doing data analysis with a certain set of practices, but they've only been able to kind of be concerned about it and to express the, the, the need for hygiene. But it's now in, in a new world where you can simulate the effect of a data analysis practice across a huge corpus of possible different data analyses that have actually been done and published. And you could see if they would have turned out differently. And maybe that matches the, maybe that's getting at the question that you asked. So, other questions? Not long ago, there were a lot of manual weavers making textiles. They got replaced by weaving machines. And the designers of weaving machines were the new employed people. How about the end of theory-based science? Theory-based scientists are replaced by algorithms. And now the data scientist is a designer for algorithms and not for theories anymore. What do you think about this? It's, it's not a happy thought. <laughs> uh, I, but I, I, okay, so I'll just mention that um, while there are thoughts that theory is unnecessary uh, in light of deep learning, uh, I think what's, what actually is happening is there'll be a need for more theory. It's just going to take the theorists time to learn what world they're operating in and what are the rules of this thing. That's why I've tried to give these three boxes here and, and allow people to see how it might uh, 
relate to questions they can answer. So I, I think if you look at uh, the project of Professor Gross that I mentioned, that's an example of a theorist who's understood this new paradigm as trying to show a particular theoretical point about a particular use of deep learning. So I, I think um, once theorists learn how to operate, they'll still make contributions. Okay, other questions? Yes? Um, hi, so um, thank you for, for your definition for data science and what it is. Um, I still miss two points in your definition. First, um, I liked how you under, underlined the impact of data science on our lives and the amount of data collecting. Uh, where does ethical data science fit in here? First and second, um, what about uh, accountability? How far do you trust these algorithms? There was no point in the talk where you addressed these two things. What is your position to, to these two issues? Well, uh, uh, ethical and moral issues can certainly be pursued under this definition. The, it, we can be concerned with the exploitation of the data. And one of the ways we can be concerned is we can have ethical concerns, we can have moral concerns. And, um, and so, in my view, if there were a department of data science, you could have ethicists in such a department. Why not? It would seem to be that this is a transformation that's affecting all of human life, and, and we need such people. And they should be in such a department so they can be in touch with all the technologists and see what they're doing so that they can uh, hear about the latest and greatest things and start uh, running it against their ethical filters. I just, I, I mean, I'm not waving the flag saying I'm you know, advocating something. I'm just, I'm just, I think this is a, uh, this definition works. Okay, and then uh, you mentioned a second concern. I'm sorry, I lost my train of... Uh, but I think that's also a concern, right? Uh, that's, that's a valid concern here. So you could do research into privacy leakage, for example. You could do research into the effects on people's psyche of uh, what's happening here. S suppose that there were, you know, mass effects of a psychological nature arising from digital transformation. Okay, here would be here would be an example. Let's imagine that digital transformation makes it easier for unscrupulous actors to find psychologically weak people and exploit them. Okay, so it'd be perfectly valid, in my view, for someone working on data science to see that this kind of illegal thing is happening and do research about ameliorating the situation. Why not? I mean, it's a thing, it's happening. It doesn't matter what I say or think. But if I were giving advice on formation of an academic discipline, this would be my advice. Okay, thank you very much for the interesting talk. Uh, but I don't think that uh, deep learning is just a new hype in machine learning. I think it's fundamentally different than uh, previous uh, machine learning paradigms. Because from my own experience, uh, in classical machine learning, uh, we need a lot of features, feature extraction. And that requires a lot of domain knowledge. And in deep learning, they are able to extract the feature from raw data. And that is fundamentally different. I don't have to be an uh, expert in speech recognition to build a network that is able to, to achieve a high performance or computer vision expert. 
And I think it's because uh, deep learning exploits the fundamental uh, way how our world is built. Modular, hierarchical, and uh, distributed. And I think that that is a fundamental difference between deep learning and previous machine learning algorithms. Is it your opinion? Well, I mean, time will tell, for sure. Uh, so, so definitely, uh, I guess, so I, I, I challenged uh, Jan LeCun on this, so I guess I'm on record. Um, essentially, you made a universalist claim. And I would say that, you know, I've seen some evidence of what you say to do with image data and there's some em in some particular kinds of speech data. The larger point that you're claiming that this is fundamental and that it, that it cuts across many other kinds of data I think is unproven. Now maybe it will prove out. Uh, what I, uh, the, the points that I've made here, I was trying to emphasize uh, what can make data science a science, a paradigm, something that, w that we can see as the basis for a field. I think it would be a poor idea to make deep learning the basis of a field per se. It can be a method, it can be something that you know, is successful, but it's not the science of data science, it's it's a particular tool. So, um, uh, I, so I gave a talk uh, a couple months ago in Beijing, and you know, a, a young woman who might have been an undergraduate in Tsinghua University stands up at the end of my talk, which was on eigenvalues of random matrices and other things. But she stands up and she says, "Why do we need statistics?" when we have all these awesome results from deep learning. So the, the answer I gave at the time was, um, you know, deep learning is like the horse that's just won the Kentucky Derby. Statistics is like the racetrack, the doctor, the jockey, the breeder, it's the, all the infrastructure of how to tune and evaluate and so on. And then out of that, horses emerge. Now, maybe this horse is immortal, you know, but maybe it isn't. Maybe some other horse will beat it one day. So. Uh, I, but I do feel that, you know, racetracks, doctors, jockeys, and these kinds of things, it's, it's not that the individuals are immortal, but the, the need for those particular elements in the breeding of winning systems, that never goes away. Now it's maybe unfair that I use my position here to Put another question, or maybe even maybe it's more like a remark. What concerned also me in this question was the role of mathematics, the role of theory. It seems we are in a time that theory is not needed anymore. Uh, I liked your your gold rush image, but I think we had in mathematics we had this situation about 50 years ago. Finite element methods. Finite element methods were developed by engineers, and they were just tested which which method works based on which problems with no theory. And then mathematics came in, developed new theory, elliptic PDEs, Sobolev spaces, and finally found out why certain algorithms work better than others in certain circumstances. Maybe this whole thing is a chance for mathematics. In some time there will be the question, why do some kind of algorithms win competitions and others not? And that can be a new role for mathematics. We just don't know for which kind of mathematics. Well, I, I certainly agree with the sentiment, and I feel uh, that you know once the theoreticians understand the new paradigm, they'll find a way to work within it and and do literature about it. I hope I am not interpreted as saying that uh, we have no need for theory. I but I I 
the actual reference in the title comes from an article in Wired magazine by Chris Anderson, who's the editor of Wired, that was published in 2008, where it basically said, we have no need for theory anymore. We, uh, all we need is big data and empirical modeling. And uh, many people, when they hear data science, they hear big data and empirical modeling. So uh, figuring out this whole question, I think, is of first order for everybody. And I think theorists need to learn what the new rules are that are being proposed by the data science advocates. Okay, so in the interest of time, we will now uh, finish the question and answer session. So I realize this discussion could go on for a very long time. Um, so there will be a buffet outside where uh, we can uh, continue discussion. So it's up the stairways. Um, so I would like to thank David for a wonderful talk and for his inspiring comments.